60,000 Ethiopians gave up their lives to sustain Ethiopia's freedom. And here is how it all took place. Ethiopia has an extensive and well-documented history on the global scale. And at some point in their history, they were referred to as amongst the top four superpowers of the world, body bagging everyone that dared a colonial conquest upon their land. But something different happened in 1936. But before we get there, let us flash back 49 years prior in the year 1887, where King Menelik II of Ethiopia agreed to offer up his land to the Italians to carry out whatever agenda that they may have upon Ethiopia in exchange for cash and guns. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie once said, be aware of the dangers of a single story. The treaty King Menelik signed was double-sided. One was in his native language of Amharic and the other a malicious Italian interpretation. Both documents contain completely different terms. Diving into African history in regards to colonization, this tactic is not uncommon and has been used to justify several massacres on the continent. The document King Menelik signed in Amharic had nothing to do with war nor giving up his land, whilst the Italian version had all of the above. The Italians exclaimed that if their demands were not met, that it will cause Italy to lose their dignity, and in stern words, Emperor's title to battle responded, that we too must retain our dignity. You want other countries to see Ethiopia as your protege, but that will never be. Hold on to that. We'll be revisiting that later on, as this is a prophecy that stood the test of time. The Italians feeling accomplished and justified immediately commenced their colonial campaign, declaring war against Ethiopia in 1896. This was referred to as the Battle of Adla. Ethiopia had two tactics to defend themselves. One was to play the fool because the Italians thought that this was going to be easy breezy lemma squeezy. I don't know if that's an Italian accent, but we'll pretend like it is and move on. You see, Ethiopia was not ignorant of the new era of warfare, and unbeknownst to the Italians, they had been stacking up on guns for quite some time, and when Italy found out, it was already too late. The other tactic Ethiopia implemented was to stretch Italy as thin as possible. They permitted the Italians to proceed further and further into Ethiopia to deplete their supplies of food, water and ammunition in preparation for a counterattack. The Italians grew wary, thirsty, hungry, and this was Ethiopia's cue for Requido. This was an embarrassing defeat to the Italians, a defeat that came by the hands of a people that they deemed inferior to themselves. Pause. This is more serious than you think. Ethiopia's victory sparked mass protests in Italy. The Italians protested the government's failure to implement colonial policies, and it also caused the Prime Minister of Italy to resign, leading to a change in the Italian government. How? How can a proud European power like Italy lose to a people like Ethiopia? Italy quickly became the laughing stock of Europe, being referred to as Europe's soft underbelly. Hold on to that. We'll talk about that more later on. Once again, a new era of warfare had evolved, the likes of which no other country outside of Europe was prepared for. The Italians regrouped, and a few decades later, in the year 1935, returned with a force of half a million men and hundreds of aircrafts, flooding the land with poisonous gas, and for this, Ethiopia was not prepared for, because they had made the single most crucial mistake almost every African colony had made. Trust. They trusted that the international community will stay true to their word to prevent the pursuing impending injustice that Italy was soon to embark on against Ethiopia. But the contrary was so. Bordering colonial powers prevented the supply of goods into Ethiopia, further weakening the country and, in retrospect, this was naive and a grave mistake that caused Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia everything. But you cannot completely blame him for this because this time period in history was quite different. 
This was the period of the League of Nations, the first worldwide intergovernmental organization whose principal mission was to maintain world peace. This was the same body that brought an end to World War I. The League of Nations kinda sorta evolved into the United Nations as we know today and at the time, the job of the League of Nations was to maintain peace, stability and to settle any impending disputes between rival countries. Yes, the world had changed, but this still was a time where Africans were not viewed as humans. And despite the League of Nations mission to maintain world peace, this did not conclude Africa. Its members consisted of colonial countries who proceeded over the most brutal and diabolical regimes on the African continent. And of the 63 countries in the League of Nations, None of them were African, well, except Liberia and South Africa, and we all know why. The League of Nations permitted Mussolini, the fascist leader of Italy, into Ethiopia. They were an accomplice to the genocide carried out, and they also restricted Ethiopia from defending themselves. Ethiopia subsequently fell to a more superior power. Italy won the war. The countries that were part of the League of Nations prevented supplies from entering Ethiopia. They also turned a blind eye to Emperor Haile Selassie's request for justice. Emperor Selassie said, Today it is us, and tomorrow it will be you. Another prophecy that stood the test of time. Personally, I would conclude that this was not just a battle of Italy against Ethiopia but Ethiopia against Europe. Ethiopia was alone. They had suffered mass casualties from the previous wars declared against them. They had no supplies of weapons to defend themselves. They were recovering from a famine and all odds were against Ethiopia. After the war, Italian presence in Ethiopia was accompanied by the destruction of property and the murder of hundreds of thousands of people with attacks targeting notable figures in Ethiopian societies. This include the most educated, and religious leaders. Please permit me to digress to make an important point. The only reason Italy won the war was because, well, they cheated. You may ask, Akin, it's all fair in love and war. How can one cheat when it comes to war? Let me explain. On the 22nd of August, 1864, the first Geneva Convention was signed into existence and Italy was one of the countries that agreed to the Geneva Conventions, which was a set of rules governing how war should be conducted. These were laws made to protect people that were not part of war. The rules mentioned that civilians should be protected, that people had the rights to receive care that they needed. It mentioned that the Red Cross must be identified and never targeted, and to do so was a war crime. And every single rule in the Geneva Conventions was breached by Italy, whilst the world stood still and did nothing. Obviously, the Geneva Conventions apply to everyone except Africa. The use of chemical weapons by Italy was abused, and this was against the rules of war. This also was Italy's chief strategy to maintain their dignity, and was the only path that they saw towards victory. Considering that Ethiopia lost the war, does this mean that they were colonized? Many may argue so, but the truth is, no. Colonization. The action and process of establishing control over the indigenous people of an area. Colonization is accompanied by imposing power and control. Italy was able to occupy Ethiopia and impose power, but the latter of control they did not have over Ethiopia. Italy was not able to exert control due to a nationwide patriotic confrontation. And for this, Ethiopia paid the ultimate price. And this is significant. Of all the African kingdoms that I've come across while studying, I've not seen one that responded towards colonization the way Ethiopia did. Immediately after such massacres pursued, the complete control of that kingdom came afterwards. In Ethiopia, the contrary was so. From the very beginning, Italy faced stern resistance. Ethiopia said, if you want to stay here, 
We'll make it as uncomfortable for you as possible. And Italy did everything to maintain a stronghold from familiarizing themselves with notable detractors who opposed Emperor Haile Selassie to even paying and giving a higher role to those who pledged allegiance to Italy and this new annexed colony that they're trying to create. Although the war Italy waged against Ethiopia was officially over, it wasn't. Ethiopia was like, nah bro, we're just getting started. Okay, they didn't say that, but you get the idea. They referred to this movement as the patriotic resistance. And this consisted of a multitude of rebellions and attacks on multiple Italian figures present in Ethiopia. A lot of these attacks were successful and others weren't. Those that failed were followed by a swift execution of everyone involved February 19, 1937, in an attempt to sustain their freedom. One of such attacks took place and failed. In retaliation, Italian soldiers embarked on a swift and indiscriminate massacre, ranging from various cities within the country. This was referred to as the Griziani Massacre, where 30,000 Ethiopians were killed, most of whom were children, women, religious leaders, monks, deacons, the elderly, the sick, no one was safe. What makes this different from the rest of the war crimes Europe carried out on the African continent was the speed and odious to which it was carried out. Permit me to pause here for a second. When the story of Africa is being told, it is usually told from a short-sighted, uninformed perspective. One thing that I failed to mention in this massacre was that these 30,000 people who were killed were all killed within three days. After flooding the streets of people, the soldiers would set fire to houses and point their weapons at those who dared to escape the fire. This was a whole town, a whole city, littered with carcass. When I read up on the story of Africa, 10,000, 30,000, these are all recurring numbers. Numbers that are sufficient enough to scare an entire civilization into submission. This is the final nail on the coffin to yield a colony. And those who suffered the most were not soldiers. These were civilians, farmers, teachers, and children. I hate to be graphic on this channel, but I think this is important to mention because it wraps our minds around how possible it is for a small continent to take over the entire world. And it also puts many inconsistent fallacies that we may have about Africa into perspective. As if this was not enough, Ethiopia did not surrender here. Italy being humiliated in the first war and their inability to colonize Ethiopia doubled down even more. I'm sorry, but I don't know how to put this in a word. Ethiopia was willing to fight to the last man standing. Ethiopia launched more and more and more and more attacks and made it hell for the Italians. Their attacks became more strategic and coordinated. They went after their lines of communication, food and water supply, their modes of transportation, their camps. They sent out a clear message to the Italians that you are not safe here. This was a nationwide movement and everyone was involved. You don't get it. Everyone. They armed themselves by looting weapons from Italian soldiers that they ambushed. Those who could not fight provided food and shelter for those who could. Ethiopian women are the greatest women on the planet. They played amongst the greatest roles in destabilizing the Italian forces in their country. They were viewed by the Italians as less of a threat and they used it to their advantage. They were spies, conveying confidential information to the resistance, strategically arranging assassinations of notable Italian figures. They stole weapons, intelligence, anything that they could use to remove the fog of war and to turn the tides of the battle. In many cases, because of the intelligence that they had gathered, they organized their own battalion to launch various ambushes and secret assassinations. This was not one organized movement. These were independent sleeper cells, doing whatever it is that they can to sustain their dignity, bringing to life Emperor Tato Beto's prophecy. We too must retain our dignity. You want other countries to see Ethiopia as your protege, but that will never be. The story of Ethiopia cannot be concluded without talking about the European tribal wars too.
Let me know in the comments if you heard what I just did there. Many World War II articles and resources will mention that it was the British who aided Ethiopia to drive the Italians out. That's not necessarily true. It was Nigeria. The only reason Britain gets credit for this is because they colonized Nigeria. In my previous video titled, What Will Africa Look Like If It Was Never Colonized? I mentioned of how Nigeria was responsible for the fastest military retreat in human history. In the liberation of Ethiopia was where this took place. Ethiopia had already made it uncomfortable for the Italians and Nigeria came in to deliver the final blow. The likes of Ethiopia is a symbol of African pride and a hint of African unity. Saying that Ethiopia is the only African country to never be colonized. It is an injustice to their sacrifice and we'll be remiss if we don't mention the immense sacrifice that Ethiopia went through to sustain their freedom. This video is not over. Click this video to have a full understanding of the sacrifice that Ethiopia went through. And this is needed to properly contextualize the events that took place leading to their liberation. From historical events, and even from stories told by fathers to their sons and mothers to their daughters, we know that empires and kingdoms and nations were not built on merriment and the drinking of wine. No. They were built on sacrifice, on the pain of the sons and the daughters of those lands. They were built on bloodshed death, massacres, and genocides. And while we in no way justify those evil undertakings by men, we in no way shy away from the fact that they did happen. While many in Africa and around the world like to hail Ethiopia as one nation that was never colonized, how many of us actually pause to ask ourselves what price they had to pay in order to maintain their liberty. How many of us do the research to find out the cost of the blood that was shed by this beautiful nation of Ethiopia? The term fascism refers to a form of far-right authoritarian ultra-nationalism it was characterized by dictatorial power, forcible suppression of opposition and strong regimentation of society and of the economy. Fascism dominated Central, Southern and Eastern Europe between 1919 and 1945. The word fascism comes from the Latin fasces. Fasces means a bundle, a reference to a bound bundle of wooden rods, sometimes including an axe with its blade peeping out. It's an Italian symbol that originated in the Etruscan civilization, and it was passed on to Rome, where it eventually came to symbolize a magistrate's power and jurisdiction. The Fasces was the symbol of Benito Mussolini, the first fascist leader of Europe. Benito Amilcare Andrea Mussolini, or Il Duce, which means the leader. He was born on the 29th of July, 1883, and was said to have been a disobedient, unruly, aggressive, and even moody child, even violent, attacking his fellow pupils with his penknife, stabbing one of them. He became a teacher, a brilliant-minded man, journalist, a public speaker, a trade unionist. He was arrested several times along the way, and eventually he became a magnetic political figure who catalyzed the violent fascist movement in Italy, and he used it to bully his way into becoming the youngest prime minister in the history of the Kingdom of Italy. Two years later, he fraudulently secured a fascist majority in Parliament. It was under the aegis of this brutal and arrogant regime and this bullying monstrosity of a man that Italy invaded Ethiopia in October 1935. 
as part of Mussolini's lofty dream of creating an empire for Italy, reminiscent of ancient Rome. The Ethiopia that had humiliated Italy in the Battle of Adwa or Adoa. In their bid to dominate our beautiful neighbors, the Italians dropped tons of poison gas bombs on the Ethiopians. This was in direct defiance of the 1926 Geneva Protocol, which had been signed by Italy. They used mustard gas against the Ethiopians. This is a chemical compound that belongs to the sulfur family and can present as solid or an oily liquid or a vapor. They gas bombed or sprayed this poisonous gas on men and women and children. And of course, the animals in the field were also affected. This chemical warfare strategy and equipment had been prepared well in advance of Italy's invasion of Ethiopia. And Pietro Badoglio, who took over from General Emilio di Bono in the advance that Italy was making on Addis Ababa from the Eritrea side, was very swift to apply these chemical weapons to his war of terror. The mustard gas would be exploded in mid-air and rain down burning liquid onto the skins of the men, women and children on the ground. Burning through the skin to the flesh below. The people of Ethiopia didn't even know how to treat the ones who were afflicted by this terrible poison that was sent by these Italian horror warlords. Badoglio used the gas enthusiastically without requesting or waiting for permission from Mussolini. Mussolini sent authorization afterwards. He had always planned for it to be used. It's just that his general is a little bit more swift than his written edict. When it leaked out to the international community that the Italians were using gas bombs on the Ethiopians, Europe, of course, did nothing. The League of Nations imposed sanctions against Italy on everything except oil. And Mussolini said that if the League of Nations had imposed sanctions on oil, Italy would have had to withdraw from its actions in Ethiopia within one week. I wonder what the League of Nations thought of itself when over 700,000 Ethiopians were brutally murdered by an invading force led by a power-hungry Mussolini who they could have stopped if they were not afraid of war in Europe. A war they ended up getting at the end of the day. You know how it goes. The fish rots from the head. The vicious tactics of the Italians were ordered by Benito himself. Funny, Benito actually means blessed or a blessing. Under the wickedness of Mussolini arose a war criminal by the name of Rodolfo Graziani, a military officer in the Royal Italian Army. He was also known as the Butcher of Fezzan after his malicious atrocities which he committed in Libya. Graziani was to become the overseer of Yekatit 12, also known as the Graziani Massacre, which would earn him the title, the Butcher of Ethiopia. Graziani was almost one year older than Mussolini, and just as brutal. While the Dibono and later the Badoglio advances on the capital of Ethiopia were made from Eritrea, his own came from the south, from Somalia, and he so desired to beat Badoglio, his rival, and to take the capital for his master that he used every means at his vicious disposal to do so. He is quoted as having said, Il Duce will have Ethiopia with or without the Ethiopians. He ordered the wide-scale use of poison gas and the throwing of captives from planes 
Make no mistake about it, this was an extermination and the people of Ethiopia were the target of his genocidal mania. When the word of the Italians' use of poison gas in Ethiopia leaked to the world, Mussolini ordered his troops that the broom be used against the foreigners in the battle zone. Graziani happily complied, even to the point of bombing Red Cross hospitals. Badoglio reached Addis Ababa in May 1936. And in Italy, the Italians were beside themselves with delight, hailing Mussolini as the founder of a new empire and King Victor Emmanuel as the emperor of Abyssinia. <laughs> the Italians settled down, thinking that all opposition had been quelled by their vicious tactics. And on February 19, 1937, Graziani, in a benevolent and festive mood invited the Ethiopian nobility to celebrate the birth of the Prince of Naples at his palace in Addis Ababa. Also invited to the festivities were needy Ethiopians who dwelt in the capital to receive arms from Graziani, who was clearly in a magnanimous mood. Unbeknownst to him and his compadres, Abraha Depoch and Mogus Asgidom from Eritrea and a third person, a local taxi driver, Simeon Adefres, had come to spoil the party. In the midst of the festivities, Abraha and Mogus approached the steps where Graziani and all of his colleagues stood, enjoying and watching the festivities. And then they launched their surprise attack, lobbing 10 to 18 grenades directly at the object of their hate. Graziani. They set off a myriad of explosions that killed Graziani's head of staff and two of his generals and put Graziani in hospital, bleeding profusely from over 200 pieces of metal shrapnel stuck inside his body. Once the explosion died down, the federal secretary, Guido Cortese, realized there was nothing more to fear, pulled out his pistol from his holster and fired at the Ethiopian nobility gathered there. Fired, shot after shot, round after round, emptying his clip. Emboldened by Cortese's move, the Italian Carabinieri, or however you pronounce that, don't really care, picked up their weapons and fired into the crowd. Men and women and children, old and young, crippled, walking with canes, blind, broken down women who were looking after children. Over 200 people dead in moments after the explosion. Abraha and Mogus escaped, whisked away by Simeon's taxi, and were taken to the Debre Libanos Monastery for shelter, hoping to seek asylum in Sudan later. Graziani, stricken down, made a show of being unswerving after the attack on his life. But Mussolini's son-in-law later gave a different report, saying that he was shaken by the incident and that it affected him for years afterwards. Anyway, in a cable to Mussolini, Graziani said that he had ordered the taking of exceptional police measures in the aftermath. This was confirmed as Cortese issued the following orders. Comrades, today is the day when we should show our devotion to our Viceroy, that's Graziani, by reacting and destroying Ethiopians for three days. For three days I give you carta bianca, that's carte blanche, to destroy and kill and do what you want to the Ethiopians. Those were his words. Based on eyewitness accounts, even non-military Italians living in Addis were on standby waiting for orders for retaliation. When they came, an unholy terror was visited upon the Ethiopians by police, by military personnel, and non-military personnel alike. Fuel was poured in houses, and these were set alight. Anyone who tried to escape was pushed back into the flames to be consumed by the fire or bludgeoned to death, stabbed or shot. Firemen 
were turned away from burning homes and told by their Italian commanders that these actions, those of the burning houses, were known to them. Ethiopians were chained to trucks and driven around until their bodies were dismembered. Soldiers took photos while standing on the dead bodies of their victims. The Italians looted, beheaded, machine gunned and stabbed in a murderous frenzy, all the while shouting, Il Duce! Il Duce! Il Duce! In honor of their lord, Mussolini. I told you, the fish rots from the head. Dr. Ladislav Sava had this to say. I am bound to say, for it is true, that blood was literally streaming down the streets. The corpses of men, women and children over which vultures hovered were lying in all directions. Great flames from the burning houses illuminated the African night. The number of people murdered during the Graziani massacre is said by our brothers and sisters in Ethiopia to be 30,000 in three days. This number is of course disputed. Even if it was the lower number of 19,200 that has been claimed by some, that would put it at 20% of the Addis Ababa population in 1937, dead in three days, including the monks of Debre Libanos Monastery for their part in sheltering Abraha and Mogus, who were murdered by the locals for their actions or possibly for the horrific consequences of the grenade throwing action that they took. For had it been successful, maybe it would have been a different thing. But my question is this, how did our Ethiopian brothers and sisters not only survive psychologically without succumbing to the mind numbingly awful attack of the Italians, the attempts by these Italians to bend them to their will but they actually shook that off and fought back. According to Dr. Richard Pankhurst, this terrible massacre is generally agreed to have had a profound influence on Ethiopian thinking. It gave them new strength to resist, to fight, to overcome. According to the New Times and Ethiopian news correspondent who was based in Djibouti, Addis Ababa was almost empty of Abyssinians and they added that as a result of the incident, the Abyssinians knew there was nothing left for them but to fight. And the world will presently hear that they are everywhere attacking anew. Those who fled from Addis well know what to expect from Italy and they will fight again, they said. Fight again, they did over and over and over unrelentingly with resilience and with passion and with determination and commitment. Listen to this Patriot Manifesto which was written by the Patriots, the resistance, to the notables and elders of Goja. Through Christian prayer and by the will of God, we stand ready to fight and overcome for the freedom of our country and our religion advancing and up to now always victorious and not suffering any discomfiture. Turning to the actions of the Italians in their document, they said that the Italians had come to make our race disappear and to take away our property for they do not wish the Amharas and the Galas to live and rule. As for Ras Hailu, the Italian's closest collaborator, it asked what territorial command the invaders had given him and declared that while the chief's notables and many of the people were being killed, Ras Hailu had betrayed the Ethiopian people. For he piled up wealth in the capital, sought to register the inhabitants and cattle of Gojam for his own advantage and they asserted, had even begun to choose Ethiopian women as wives for the Italians. 
children of Gojam and Walata Israel. The manifesto concluded, fight for the Christian religion. The more patience you have, the worse things will be for your soul, your property, your children and your religion. Now, by the will of God, the rays of the sun are coming to our country. We will very soon send you a great announcement. In the name of our religion, you must resist the enemy at the opportune time. Above all, we advise you to fight, even with local weapons. If you do not have enough arms, send us faithful persons and receive arms from us. We beg you to send copies of this letter to all Gojam and Begemder. Pass on the word to the chiefs and the nobles. This was the heart of the resistance, the passion that they felt, the commitment and the dedication. Resistance continued. Mussolini knew no peace. Graziani was replaced in December 1939 and eventually the Italians left in 1941, having failed to crush the resistance. Haile Selassie returned from exile and from waging his own battles with the League of Nations and Ethiopia continued on, unconquered. God bless Ethiopia. That's the spirit that we need in Africa. The indomitable spirit that never backs down in the face of the worst. Over 700,000 Ethiopians dead to fight for their liberty. And that's only in the war from 1935. Now I'm not saying that what we need to do is to pick up arms and go and be violent against people. That's not what I'm advocating for. I'm advocating for the spirit of Africa the one that has courage, the one that knows who they are, that says we are not going to be your prisoners or your slaves. The one that says to Facebook and to YouTube, keep your money. If it means selling my dignity so that I only post the content that you like and you approve of, keep your money. I don't want it. That's what we need. The courage to say, mm. These people are trying to dominate us. We're not interested. We're going to find another way and we're going to make it. That's what we need. The courage to say when someone comes with a check offering you $1 million for an idea or a project that you have that you will never see again once you hand it over. To tell them, you know what? I'll go hungry. It's fine. But I'm building this thing until I see it come to life. That courage to say that we are different from the rest of the world, to say that we are African, for there to be a resonance in our spirits, that we are something unique and special and awesome, like Ethiopia has demonstrated so boldly and continues to even as they face such trial, because we know that this trial in Ethiopia has been manufactured by wicked men who have wanted to control them for this long and still try. So, when do we change our pursuits? To be noble enough to say Africa is important for us and it's important enough for us to fight for again. To fight for our true independence, our true sovereignty, our true unity, our true harmony, our true fulfillment of all our potential and our entirety of our destiny. When do we say that? As you can see guys, this video was a product of a collaboration between Akin Akin and Singi Africa Television. Thank you Akin for letting us be part of this process. It has been of tremendous benefit. We are grateful. To everyone who's watching, like, share, subscribe to Akin Akin's channel and to ours. And let's keep talking and sharing these stories, not for entertainment, but for transformation. Africa needs you now.